Okay, so there we go. All right, let's get started. Um, I'm down here in Florida. Thank you, Hurricane Irma, that just waltzed back here a couple of weeks ago. We have recovered. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Um, who am I? Why am I doing this workshop, this panel discussion with you? I've been singing a long time. I mean, I've actually even been paid to every once in a while to do some singing. I've played tuba. I've had a real strong musical background. I've sung opera. I've sung light opera. I've done small ensemble groups. I wrote something called the Astronomer Songbook. And there's even an ISB number, which is available at Amazon.com. And I've done all kinds of workshops uh, and uh, 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 papers at a lot of different planetarium conferences over the years. Um, I, I like to do the songs. I started doing singing because I needed it for uh, workshops I was doing with kids. You cannot do a two-hour workshop with kindergartners and just do straightforward lecture. That just doesn't work. So let's talk about what you need in order to do a space song. Uh, first of all, you need you. And then the question is, can you sing? Are you comfortable standing in front of people and singing? Uh, I'm assuming because we're all here on this and we're all agreed that we want to sing. So let's just go from there. You have to decide what kind of musical accompaniment you want. Do you want to have it uh, piano? Is it guitar? Is it auto harp? I cannot play the guitar, but I can play the auto harp. So that can let me do things like uh, Peter Jedeke's Einstein was a genius. Unlike you and me, he wrote equations every day. On Mondays, he wrote three. Mondays, he wrote three. Albert, dance around. Albert, be profound. Albert, let your hair stick out in your socks. Hang down. So you can use the auto harp if you can't play the guitar. You could do something with karaoke. I have a few examples of that coming up later in the PowerPoint. If you've got a good enough voice, you can try something a cappella like Stars shine at nighttime, all through the nighttime. Stars shine at nighttime to show us the way. When you're lost in the dark and you're not sure which way to go, stars shine to guide you so you will not stray. Which is one thing you can do if you can carry it, particularly if you've got a lot of people to help you out too. Part singing is always beautiful. Uh, if you want people to sing along, or if you want to sing and not have to worry about memorizing the words, you can, of course, also put them up either as handouts or on a screen projected through a video. Or uh, then, of course, you've got to have a place to sing, a campfire, a classroom setting, or because I operate a planetarium, we use the theater. It's got great acoustics. It's got very comfortable seats, and we can do all kinds of multimedia in there, including putting PowerPoints and, and full dome video up on the dome. Uh, we have actually done this from time to time with some of our college students here, where I brought a bunch of students in, and we, we practiced a whole set of songs that we presented to people for some of our regular shows. Sort of an interesting blend of um, planetarium lecture meets karaoke night at Applebee's. So it was a good. It was a good event. We went through uh, getting some uh, students from the college. Uh, Dr. Dale Reith and our music department helped locate some students. We used uh, the local radio station's man uh, uh, engineer, Joe Leonardine, to help with karaoke laydowns. Uh, Dr. Reith played many piano renditions of songs. We brought the students in. We practiced a lot. That's uh, very important. We wrote the script for it, put in some numbers. We storyboarded it. We did the special effects, the video, the programming. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? We practiced a lot, of course. And we had dress rehearsals and we promoted it and then we presented it to uh, unsuspecting public. Uh, the script, basically the premise of it was, these are all fine art students who are also happen to be my astronomy students and they're worried about an upcoming test. They kind of work their way into the, the audience and they keep op open, as I'm opening up, they keep asking questions. So we say, well, let's get you ready for the test and also entertain these people. And so the student questions move along and segue to the various different songs we presented. And of course, for all their hard work, they get an A. And they all sing, the letter, sing a, a note A for that. And these are some of the songs we did. We worked out the timings. And the total show time was 45 minutes, including the conversation in between the tunes. And the results were fabulous. Uh, the, the audiences loved it. The students learned about it. And they had a lot of fun, too. These hadn't started off as astronomy students, but they quickly picked it up. And the show one was about right. We, we did enough shows to justify the amount of time we spent rehearsing, but not so many that the students had to uh, forego other obligations for family, home, work, and so on. 
and we're going to do it again. I've got uh, I've got uh, a program coming up this winter where we're going to have the space songs return, and uh, we have a whole bunch of new songs to try out on an unsuspecting audience. So how do you write a space song? Some of this has been covered already. Dr. Aaron had mentioned. I know I'm forgetting something important here, but let's talk about this. You have to have talking points that somehow connect the songs into a lecture that makes some sort of logical sense or pattern. Uh, you can hand out song sheets in a real dark room that's hard to work with, so we just project the words up onto the planetarium dome. Uh, musical company is good, uh, and we have, like I say, Dr. Reith did a lot of piano for us. You could do just an out loud recitation, but that's poetry night, and uh, takes me too far back into the 60s for that kind of experience, so I don't want to do that. Acapella, we tried. Karaoke, great. If you can bring in somebody who can play the piano or another keyboard, excellent guitar, of course, and auto harp as I use. I've actually we've done things with ukulele before too. Uh, oh, this is the important thing. Before you decide to do a show, you got to know who you're presenting to, who's your audience. So you have to tailor it for them, for their level of understanding, for their potential level of interest as well. How do you write it? Well, you figure out a topic that you think deserves a song. Uh, you create, or better in our case, since we're doing parody, we appropriate a tune that works. It can't be too hard to sing. It should be a memorable melody that can be hummed. And ideally, it should be in the public domain or fair use area. I used to look through, and I still do look through old song books to get ideas for songs that can be done, like Little Brown Jug became Little Brown Dwarf. That was a pretty easy one to figure out. Uh, decide which concepts you want to write about. So you look at a particular uh, area of knowledge and you say, well, what is it important for the student to come away with? What are the terms we want to, to help them remember? A rhyming dictionary is very important. I have an old Walker's rhyming dictionary, which works, but I go to the internet. I've used rhymezone.com. It really helps a lot. Oddly enough, if you use the planet Mars in a song, you're probably going to end up using the word stars at some point because it's one of the few words that rhymes with Mars, which also applies. Mars, far, things like that. Make the syllables agree with the original lyrics. Dr. Aaron was talking about that. Uh, keep or modify any original lyrics that might work. And again, use the internet. You pull down and get the original lyrics to the songs, lay them side by side, and uh, where they work, they work. Um, what music works? You can write your own songs. Uh, I know that uh, our physics shantos, Linda Williams, does that, and it's incredible. I've only written one original tune, which was Ode to a Black Hole, which uh, after singing it, you know, though you're just a big black hole in the fabric of space and time, and people say you got a dark side, but who doesn't? That's not a crime. So you can see where we're going here. I should use somebody else's music. I'm not much of a tune maker, but I'm a darn good lyricist, and I've been having a lot of fun taking familiar tunes and just modifying them to my own, my own methods and means. Folk songs are great. Public domain songs, uh, classical music is good. Mostly that's in the public domain. Opera is in there too, as well as light opera. Um, music that was written in the United States before 1923 is generally copyright free. Um, what does not work? Well, I, I stay away from sacred music. It, it's just, uh, I don't want to go there. It's, for example, it, it just has too strong a connection with the sacred to be used as a secular tune. I just don't like to do it. And as a rule, I avoid music that's strongly identified like the national anthem. But uh, again, the Battle of the Hymn of the Republic, uh, that's been set to different words too, and that, that seems to work. You have to judge it based on audience response. This is what I've researched on the internet. Any copyrighted music written in the ISS after 1923 is gonna be a problem unless you get permission for it. Or in the case of us as being teachers, it meets the fair use doctrine which uh, is helpful, but not, not bulletproof in terms of what we can sing and get away with. Um, anything after 1922, but before 1978, that's protected for 90 year, 95 years, currently from the date of publication. So you want to go for something prior to 1923. Uh, and I should also mention, this is what I've read and researched. There are other smarter people out there who are actually lawyers who can tell you better advice than I give you. Uh, avoid genres or styles or difficult to sing pieces that you can't do. As a rule, I stay away from rap. I just don't have the ability to do that and carry it off effectively. I go with old folk songs and things like that, things that have a kind of a classical bet more than anything else. I tend not to do too much rock and roll with, with some exceptions. Do not sing out of your range. Find the notes that you're comfortable. You don't want to be singing too high, where so you kind of strain the voice. 
Um, I find that when I am singing in practice, I don't uh, I, I pitch it lower than when I'm singing in front of others. It carries better when it's got a higher pitch to it. Fair use and copyright. Well, this gets into a lot of different uh, areas of debate. I mean, the question you have to ask yourself is this. We all know that Weird Al Yankovic basically makes his musical career on parody. And uh, because that's the case, uh, it's definitely a parody or commentary on the original song. And that, that works into paving the way. Now, he always asks for permission. He always gets permission, even though in some cases he doesn't really need it. Um, but who are you trying to target? And, and family and friends are going to be different from your class. That's different from the general public. Are you going to make money doing it? I mean, are you going to be getting money as a result of this? Or is it going to have a negative effect on the copyright holder's ability to make money using it? That's, that's possible. The best thing to use in terms of if you are going to do a parody is you have to demonstrate that the song can only be done, can only be done with that particular thing. Like, for example, if I wrote a song about um, black holes, well, I could write most anything. I could use copyright free like um, Black Hole Hokey Pokey. This is one that uh, Sam Storch, a friend and colleague of mine, came up with, which is uh, you put your left arm in. And that's it. Now, who can sue you over something like that? On the other hand, if you're going to do um, uh, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid is what I meant to say. You're a molecule that's here to stay. Oh, I believe in DNA. Well, I didn't have to use that Beatles tune by McCartney to, uh, to do that. I could write a song using any tune for DNA. But on the other hand, I did contact Jimmy Buffett with a letter saying, I'd like to use your volcano song and build on it. And if I could do that, that would be great. Well, I, I couldn't really do another volcano song that built on the volcano song without doing the volcano song. So in that sense, it, it really, you did need that original song. Just as if I were to do uh, night and day, there's rotation. As you rotate into the shadow, then back out again. I mean, that you've got to do Cole Porter's night and day uh, in order for that to work, or you could make that argument anyway. So speaking of that, let's get into the singing part. Uh, this is the part in the panel discussion where I was kind of hoping we could all sort of sing along, but uh, that's not going to work. So you're just going to have to endure the karaoke scene in your offices, and I'll sing along too. So here we go. Is that sound coming through all right? Can you hear it okay? Yes, yes. Yes, we hear it. Now, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know where I'm gonna go when the volcano blows. I don't want to live up on Maxwell Mountain, Venus is not where I want to be. Temperature hot as a pizza oven, molten hot rock and we disagree. I don't know. Now I don't know. I don't know where I'm gonna go when the volcano blows. I don't want to be on no Mount Olympus. Seventeen mile up the air is thin. Carbon dioxide is not for breathing. Ours is too cold for me frozen skin. Singing, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I'm gonna go when the volcano blows. I don't want to go to Okita Terra. I was not where I want to stay. Jupiter's moon smell like eggs on a rock. Sulfur dioxide for sure not okay. Sing it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I'm gonna go when the volcano blows. I don't want to travel too far out Neptune. They from a breath turn to solid ice. Nitrogen gases on frozen moon Triton. Swimming in methane lakes is not so nice. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I'm gonna go when the volcano blows. 
Don't want to live out on tiny old Pluto, land of perpetual twilight rain. Hundreds of years just to make one orbit. Sun is a tiny spot far, far away. I don't know. Now I don't know. I don't know where I'm gonna go when the volcano blows. I think I will live on this pretty blue planet. This is my home and I want to stay. Volcanoes on Earth not half as scary as most of the things in the big Milky Way. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I'm gonna go when the volcano blows. One more time now. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I'm gonna go when the volcano blows. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about. Did I run out of my time? Should I stop? Yes, John, you're out of time. Thank you very much. All right, more if you need it or, or can stand it. Next. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, we have Kevin Furland. Try to get that song out of your head. 